podcast. I'm Taylor Edwards. And I'm Koi Branscombe. And today's guest is the first Asian American Assemblywoman in Manhattan, State Assembly member Yulin Yu. Hi! Hi. How How's it going? Good, we're good. How are you? Um, <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's like the 2020 answer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's just like it's a little bit rough this year. Yeah. How are you? Um. Hmm. Uh, right. Um, I think I'm that's. Gonna be honest. <laughs> right. Hey, that's what we're here for. Honesty. Let, let's just do it. You know. That's what this is about. That's my whole vibe. Yeah. It's Give like... us your real truth. Yeah. Not that. I mean, you always do, though. I feel. Yeah. Always. Oh, always. <laughs> always. <laughs> I, not be. <laughs> yeah. I have to tell you, we're like, I'm a big fan of, of your Twitter account. Mm -hmm. I love your tweets. Oh, oh no. <laughs> no, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's awesome. I like, anytime I see, like, you know, I'm like one of those like aimless Twitter scrollers. It's like, I check Twitter, log out, and then my brain's like, we should log back into Twitter. <laughs> and I'm like, anytime I see your name pop up, I'm like, oh, hell yeah, this is going to be good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I say some weird stuff on there, probably. <laughs> that's, that's what Twitter's for. We, and um, very informational. Yeah. I'm always educated by you and your tweets. That's good. I mean, well, so I feel like it's really important to be more transparent about all of the things that go on in government. I think that people don't realize how messy and out of control it actually is. Right. And then, or, or they think that it's like way more convoluted and complex than just like people didn't know about it or um oh, yeah. or they think that you know we're it's like some diabolical thing but it's actually just that people uh who you know speak up are saying a certain thing and that's like you know it's, it's as simple as that so i just wanted yeah. to give a little transparency to what i'm seeing and then just it's really like more of an observational uh feed i guess than anything else <laughs> absolutely that's so awesome you're making politics accessible to everybody and that is the point it should be accessible right should be. because it doesn't american politics doesn't work unless citizens and residents are engaged mm -hmm. that's right that's right absolutely it's actually like a big part of why we invited you on like yes. that's the whole point of this podcast you're like we want to <laughs> make all of this accessible like let's just get into the nitty-gritty like let's just talk about it plainly um and then also to like i feel like rehumanize because it's really easy i think for people on on the right, especially like they love to, and on the left, people like to villainize people who believe in progressive values. Yes. Um, and I, I think okay. they just like, it's like their pastime. It's like, what are we doing this Saturday? We're gonna villainize <laughs> some progressives. Um, and, uh, you know, we wanna rehumanize that and kind of combat yeah. that by reminding Very people that- that you say that because it's so interesting that the groups of folks who are trying to actually, um, you know, try to bring things back to people um, and center it on people is yeah. uh, being the ones that are like demonized when yeah, I, I know. always have been around people, right? Yeah. yeah. It's like, we're just trying to do this the right way, the good ethical way, and <laughs> you're angry about it. And that's really confusing. <laughs> like, well, because of the power shift, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's one of the things that, uh, is very startling right now and i think that that's happening on the federal level on the state level on the city level i think that a lot of people are definitely seeing a shift right and i think that there's mm -hmm. um a change in who we believe should be in power i mean i remember when i was a kid you know when i was much younger i remember you know that i was very much you know starting to become a lot more aware politically around me you know just kind of being like oh why is this street here why is this um you know stop sign here why is this garbage can here like why is it that like you know certain people have these things and other people don't like why is it that you know after four accidents this this community has been fighting for this one thing of a stop sign and yet they couldn't get it you know what is it that's going on within like these circumferences of little things that um, affect us every single day and yet you know we're uh, people don't realize it's actually political right like there's like things that are political and there's things that are you know you need to have access to government in order to make sure that your community is getting the access that they need and I started to think about you know what I you know how um, how I align, right? And my parents, um, obviously, you know, immigrant family, also Asian uh, descent. And, um, you know, when I was uh, very young, we lived in, you know, a lot of different places, you know. So my parents actually, when we first moved here, uh, came to Moscow, Idaho. <laughs> it was like, let's pick the most racist place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> got to look in there. Yeah. Someone emails us from Idaho. Um, excuse me. <laughs> I, <know>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, the KKK is there. The neo-Nazis are there. Like, it's right where Coeur d'Alene is and Spokane. Wow. And, yeah. So, like, that little area, even though it's, like, literally one of the most beautiful places on earth. If you've ever seen Coeur d'Alene, like, the lake itself, you're just like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> it's breathtaking. But uh, it's it's the hub of uh, the white supremacist. So, <laughs> God, so, I just learned something um, so important. <laughs> Come for the views, stay for the racism. <laughs> yeah, so. Oh my I, God. I mean, yeah, no, my parents, I mean, they moved from place to place and then, but we also had really awesome neighbors and really awesome friends. And like, you know, my parents had support even though there was like this like, also this like blatant racism that was going on. Like, you know, <sighs> my mom doesn't st- didn't stick me in daycare after, you know, she had me there because of some incidences that happened. So, you know, there were just things that made it so that, you know, my parents started to see these little things and why it mattered. And I started to be more aware as I was growing up um, of these little unfair things, unjust things, and like um, how, you know, there's like certain things that make us align with certain parties and other things that, you know, deter us from certain things. And, um, and I uh, started to see that my parents, they didn't really have, they cared about, you know, certain things like the fact that when they first immigrated here, uh, Ronald Reagan was actually president and Mm -hmm. they felt like, you know, he gave opportunities for certain students overseas. So maybe they were Republican. That's how they felt. Like maybe that wow. those national relations helped them to have these opportunities. And um, and then when uh, when my mom started to become more aware of like some of the social services and things, because she's a nurse, she was just like, no, no, I support you know the WIC program. I support you know mm-hmm. having choices for um, for people to have a safety net. And I think that you know it's really important that um, you know we have social safety nets and. So my mom was just like, no, 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 I think I'm more Democrat. And then, and then, you know, she, she's like, no, she voted for Bill Clinton. And then like, you know, then later on she was just, we were in Texas. And so then she was like, no, I think we, you know, so like they voted for, you know, the first woman governor and Richards, but then they also voted for Bush for president. So Mm -hmm. after he was governor, right. Because he was the governor of Texas. And so Mm -hmm. they were just like, I don't know, like maybe he's fine. Yeah. And so like, there's like things that kind of, of like just didn't you know uh i think it was more personal than political and then but we have to also realize that the personal is political right and Mm -hmm. so there are things that just kind of um you know kind of uh you know changed along along the way and so yeah so they they were so proud to have like richards and she was so progressive and such an awesome woman and that was the first time i actually saw a woman be governor and so that kind of opened my eyes to like how how um how there were possibilities for, for women. But at that time, I remember the Democratic Party used to be saying certain things that um, really moved me, but also, you know, I didn't, I because I, I mean, we lived in a time when, you know, it was still like this whole thing, you know, about, you know, dare to be drug free and like all this stuff, you know, right. like, do you remember mm-hmm. like the, the uh, Officer McGraw or Detective Yes, yes. <laughs> in my school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like all of those things that like, you know, criticized as children and um and and I and I also remember thinking um you know just like accepting a lot of these barriers that uh that are internalized within you know the oppressions that were internalized I guess like as a child right like is can people of color be you know in politics can women uh be governor or president you know and so I I just I never I never thought that I had internalized those things until those things were broken, right? And mm-hmm. and I also remember the Democratic Party being the party to say, like, we want to have more people of color, um, you know, be in positions to run. And that was the first time that I actually started to see people of color running for office. And, um, and that was also um, what kind of, you know, was in my head. But then... Um, now that we're here, <laughs> now that we are at the table, they want us to be something else. They want us to be the kinds of uh, politicians that they want us to be, um, and and in their image, I guess. And I think that, and I think that you know, if you know, I, I just think that <laughs> it's like it, truly inviting somebody to the table is also accepting that they're going to be fighting for their communities and that they're, they're going to be uh, giving a different viewpoint. And those different yes. viewpoints for, for our communities are accepting of um, women 
and <laughs> of people of color, of uh, folks with disabilities and people who are LGBTQ and uh, who, you know, um, understand, you know, that there are different layers to different things and who might not always see eye to eye uh, with certain things, you know, and aren't going to, you know, <laughs> try to take on those opportunities once they're let off by another party or whatever. And I think that, um, you know, we are going to want to fight for more transparency and more access because we've seen what it's like to not have it. And I think that that's something that, I don't know. <laughs> for yes. me, it was just like the way that the, the party has asked for us to be participating, but then they want to stop us when we are here. So. Right. Well, it's interesting that you bring up just like seeing like the time you remember seeing a woman be in charge and and seeing all these like um groundbreaking moments of of different people in leadership and and this idea that we have to fit a mold even when we get that kind of leadership um and access to that table um and i keep hearing this a lot from people that we interview they go i didn't think somebody like me could be in in leadership i didn't think that i it's for older people it's for straight people it's for straight white men like it's like the, the same pattern over and over again so what what specifically inspired you to to get yourself in the arena and, and run for office? Um, that's a little hard because I actually never intended to run for office. I think that um, probably you also hear that from a lot of women and especially women of color um, mm -hmm. that, you know, I just, I think that that was never in my, you know, view of like what I could be or what I wanted to be. And, um, and I think that for me, I, uh, I honestly, it was a mix of things. So in Washington state, I actually had a couple of mentors who always wanted to push me to run for office. And I was like, no. And I like actually went into my, <laughs> like, I'm escaping from all of you, like, no. <laughs> you know? And I had amazing mentors, you know, I even, you know, uh, Sharon Tomiko Santos, who's like one of the uh, first women of, you know, Asian descent to ever win elected office on the state level anywhere, right? And she was, she was so classy and beautiful. And I called her mom. She was just like, you know, she like was the person who was willing to pull clothes out of her own closet to dress me for my interviews because she knew I couldn't afford it, you know? Um, she's that person. So um, I, I had that, that so much. much. Yeah. I mean, like when you have like, you know, people who are pushing you and lifting you up, you're like, you don't want to disappoint them, right? And, um, you know, there's people like, uh, you know, Auntie Ruth Wu and uh, even, you know, Gary Locke, who was the governor, you know, that was the first time, by the way, I ever saw an Asian American be governor. And I was like, like that also broke something inside of me that was yeah. like, oh, this can be done, you know? So I was coming from a place where, you know, there were Asian American leaders and uh, Asian Americans were a voice in government. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I came here to New York, um, I actually was uh, here for my master's and, um, I met up with an alumni of my master's program who ended up, I work for assembly member Ron Kim. And uh, he was the first Korean American to ever win any office in New York, uh, which is startling because there is a very large Korean American community here in New York. But on top of that, um, it was for the only seat that's ever been Asian American in the entire New York State Assembly at the time. And so he was the only one up there. And I just remember walking up to the Capitol with him and being like, yeah, I'm your chief of staff and I'm gonna go and do, you you know, do things with you. And the first thing that happens is like somebody, you know, I think that they're very well intentioned. I know the person who's still a colleague, he's very nice, but he came up to Ron was just like, do you know how to dance Gangnam style? And then he looked at me and he was just like, congratulations on winning Congress because he thought I was Grace Meng. And um, I, I was just like, wait, you worked with Grace Meng for like four years. She was your colleague. Like you couldn't tell the difference. And it was just kind of like, oh no. <laughs> Like what did what happened here and and then i i realized how lonely he was you know and and how little representation our communities had and then i looked at the budgets and i was like holy crap you know asian americans make up over 13 percent of new york state and yet we have less than one dollar <laughs> we have zero dollars in our state budget like that's allocated directly to asian americans and so i was just kind of like oh gosh, like it's because we don't have enough representation at the table and we don't have a large enough voice. And then I saw issue after issue after issue, you know, um, crimes against Asian Americans, even when they're aimed at Asian Americans are not deemed as hate crimes. Like what, what is it, what's going on there? You know, like what is happening to, um, to us to where uh, there's such little voice for our community, right? And, and I realized like, okay, in New York, uh, by the way, you know, New York state politics is 
is global politics, right? Let's be very, very frank about that. Like, yes, a lot of people might think, well, why does New York think the you know, center of the universe? But it's, it, it is kind of true in a lot of senses that, you know, our budget is so large, right? Our New York state budget is so large, our New York city budget is so large, and um, we are the economic drivers for uh, our state. We're also the economic drivers for the country alongside like you know, California and a couple other states. Like we just, there's a lot of things that also are progressive drivers, right? A lot of the legislation that we pass here, a lot of other states will pass, um, you know, alongside, right? And I think that there's a lot of things that drive it, right? And so because of that, you know, that, that ability to do that, I just felt it was so uh, startling and stark that uh, a state with such a large Asian American population, literally um, the state with the second largest Asian population, um, you know, I think, you know, or no, maybe third, but like, it's like Hawaii. And then <laughs> so it's, like, it's like Hawaii, California, and New York, right? And, I, and I'm just like, well, <laughs> you know, we should have um, more Asian American representation. And so, uh, you know, when the opportunity came, uh, obviously I didn't think that, you know, uh, my name should be dropped into the pool. But then I realized like, you know, cause Ron was just like, well, why do you think that, don't you think that you're better suited than, you know, like, don't you think that you could do this? And like, I was like, yeah, actually you're right. Like I can, and I have 20 years of legislative experience. Like I should have more confidence in myself. But um, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's about representation and it's about making sure that uh, my community had a voice and I saw where it didn't. And so I knew that because of my experience, uh, I could plug in um, and uh, help to make sure that everybody in my community got heard. Um, you know, there's a lot of people being left out right now. You know, I saw that, you know, NYCHA had completely been, you know, there was like disinvestment, like from, from, you know, 30 years now, you know, it's just, it's been, it's been really tough, you know? And so uh, you're seeing the, the results of it. And, um, and so everybody here needs a voice. And I felt like because I knew how government worked, because I had worked as a staffer, as somebody who, uh, you know, advocated, as somebody who, you know, was somebody that worked my whole entire life on the state level uh, mm -hmm. and, and fought for, uh, you know, ending poverty, most of it. And I just think that that was one of the biggest things that I wanted to bring to the table and um, all of our different perspectives are, are valid, right? And I think that having a different perspective in our legislature is one that will make different policy. And that's the most important part. Many progressive candidates making news cycles do so because of progressives unseating establishment Democrats like AOC, for example. Can you tell us about your journey seeking public office and what led you to becoming the incumbent and a staple in New York politics? I don't know if I am a staple. And you are. honestly, a lot of people think that I'm uh, beatable uh, otherwise. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so much against me. But I, um, I think that uh, there is a, a story, I guess, that I, I um, my, my best friend and I, we talk about all the time. Um, so you guys know her, Senator Alessandra Biaggi. <laughs> yes! yes. <laughs> She's one of my favorite people on the planet. But, um, you know, my race was a very interesting one because my district was represented for over 30 plus years by the former speaker of the assembly, uh, Sheldon Silver. And uh, he was the most powerful man in New York, right? And I think that he left a huge, um, you know, uh, footprint behind, you know, in the way that government works in New York, the way that, uh, you know, constituents uh, services works in New York. And, um, and especially in this district where we have kind of, I mean, I personally, I'm just going to be very biased and obviously, you know, it's honestly true, but I, I'm still coming from a biased place. I'll just put it that way. It's the best district on. on yeah, the, on the be biased, <laughs> own it. Everyone should feel that way yeah. about their district. It it would be if weird. everyone felt that way, it'd be better. Right. It'd be weird <laughs> if you didn't feel that way and you're trying to represent it. You're like, we're okay, no, I guess. <laughs> My mom feels about me, but it's okay. Um, so Little <laughs> girl, same girl is okay. <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah, no. So you know, I mean, when people think in their mind's eye, like if you were to 
say New York City, almost everything that pops up in your head is in my district, right? And I mean, that's like, you know, Statue of Liberty, you know, Wall Street, uh, the um, Chinatown, Lion Dancing, the food, when you're talking about, you know, some of the first theaters, the best public housing, like, you know, it's like, yeah. well, you know, it's all in my district. <laughs> okay, like, to be fair, I did live in New York for a bit, mm -hmm. and almost every recommendation I made to like hang out with people was in your district. Yeah, so. Lower East Side is like, you know, I mean, if you, even if you think Madonna, you have to think about my district. Even there when you you're know. You know, Basquiat, you think about my district. If you're thinking about, you know, you know, all of the, you know, I don't know, Kanye's album cover was drawn by Joe <laughs> Kondo, who has a studio in my district. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter. It's like, it's my district. <laughs> it's the best district. And it so- is. Um, you know, it's also the birthplace of America as we know it, just so you know. Like I live right next to the, next to the uh, Francis Tavern and that's where George Washington and the Culper Spies decided to, you know, start the American Revolution or whatever. You and have so, every reason to be biased. Literally. I think so. All of them. <laughs> I so. You have all of the reasons. <laughs> I, I mean, I, and I and express them very freely. <laughs> and so that's why, you know, I think that a lot of times when when people are thinking, you know, what this seat means and uh, where this, like, where the power comes from and the history of it, you know, this is, this was Alexander Hamilton's seat. Mm -hmm. This was, you know, Al Smith's seat. This was, you know, Shelley Silver's seat. And so this is why, you know, it's so incredibly important, right? Like all of that history of New York, whether it's Tammany Hall or any of those things, like this is that seat, <laughs> this is that area, right? When it's talking about you know, the five points, when it's talking about, you know, when you're talking about all of the shipments in New York and all of the things that have happened, even when you're talking about, you know, Fear City on TV or whatever, you know, when you're thinking <laughs> about it, when you're thinking about Ninja Turtles, you're thinking about my district. And so um, this is, this is why, you know, this, the, 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 the source of, uh, of New York politics uh, always swirls around this district as well. You know, that's like where a lot of the base is. This is where a lot of the power sat. And, um, and it's historically cycled through, right? But it's never, ever, ever had a, uh, you know, even with, um, you know, the district being over 42% Asian American uh, and Asian American representative. So, um, so, so this is the first time there was a big change and uh, it also, um, you know, was a huge shift in how uh, the representation looked in New York State uh, just by me being there. Um, and, you know, I still remember this is this is a story I also like to tell because it's, um, you know, it's significant. Our post office in Chinatown is actually named after a woman named Mabel Lee. And she was one of the first women suffragettes. And she's an Asian woman who rode in to uh, the suffragette parade on a horse, like on horseback. Yes. Right? And it is fierce as <laughs> And I will just say, <laughs> it, I mean, she is one of the first suffragettes and she fought for women's rights to vote uh, before she got hers. You know, like she, she fought for it and um, never probably even got to vote because women of color, especially Asian women, didn't get to vote until uh, 50 years after, um, you know, white women were able to vote. So uh, I think that, you know, that's something that is very, very significant, right? And, um, and when I won my seat, I, I like literally the day after uh, I won, I went to go and speak at uh, Eleanor's Legacy, uh, an event there. Uh, and Eleanor's Legacy is actually, you know, named off after Eleanor Roosevelt, obviously, and um, and is a, a, a organization that helps women run, right? And uh, I got to meet uh, some young women, but I was like kind of delirious because I had like already worked like, you know, for whatever, <laughs> it felt like an eternity <laughs> to try to get elected. And um, I had just, you know, basically uh, won, won my election and, and then it was also, it was actually, it was right after my primary. So it wasn't um, like everything was done because I still uh, had to do my general, but we knew at that point, like if you won your primary, then you were, you know, going to maybe most likely win the general, mm -hmm. but it was the biggest election. And I, uh, I spoke there and that's where uh, for the first time I met a young Alessandra Biaggi and she was just like, I'm going to be taking on a race. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> that race. 
<laughs> and, um, and, and that was the first time that we met. And so um, she was just thinking about it at the time. But after I had spoken and after she knew what seat I had won, um, I think it was one of those moments where it broke something in her, right? And like, it, like mm -hmm. one of those uh, moments where she started to see what was possible. And, um, and we talk about it all the time because uh, right afterwards, you know, we realized that we took on two of the most powerful, uh, powerful uh, machines, I guess one would say, in, um, in New York and, and beat it and won. And so, you know, she obviously, uh, you know, beat Jeff Klein, who was the head of the IDC and, mm -hmm. um, and gave the uh, Senate the first time uh, in a long time a majority of Democrats. Chills. Yes. Chills. That's incredible. So having all of this, having like inspiring each other to run, what would you say to younger generations who are maybe intimidated by politics? Yeah. Mm. Um, it's never going to not be intimidating. Uh, it's never going to be easy either. And I'm going to say that this hasn't been the most rocking time or anything. This has been a very difficult time. I won my election the same day Trump won his. And um, I think that that really changed the way that politics looked um, in on every level and the way that people run on every level and the way that we use media or press or anything. And I, you know, I didn't even have a Twitter account until like two years into office. <laughs> I didn't really, you know, think, I mean, I had it, but I'd never used it, you know, and I just, I didn't really think that it was that important. I didn't think that it would be the way for people to actually understand what was going on in politics. And it was just such a strange shift and, um, you know, things that people used to find like, you know, as reasons to not never even consider a candidate now, like we're totally acceptable. And I just, I thought that, um, you know, that shift was so strange and, and also, uh, you know, odd <laughs> and, and, mm -hmm. and it was, it was hurtful in a lot of ways, but also, mm -hmm. um, and frightening. And so I think that, um, you know, within politics, there was that change, uh, with the whole world, you know, just changing in its in its way of doing things, but mostly here in America and mostly here in New York, we started to see um, a, a shift in how, like, in what was normal uh, in in day to day politics, right? Like, it it, it was it's become uh, a little bit scary, like sometimes when you think about you know some of the things that uh, can happen, and that's why I'm like very you know inspired by like some of the stuff that's been going on with like ranked choice voting, and I think that you know there's been candidates helping candidates there, and like I think it's very powerful and meaningful, and you know I think I've always been coming from an organizer's perspective in all of the things that I do because of um, just my own background in organizing, and I just think that uh, it's always more powerful to be a coalition and to build that coalition and to have unity and to have people like you know. Uh, you know, lead from all places and rather than, um, you know, from the top or like <laughs> oppressively, right, right. you know, and I think that um, that's just like the way that I am. And so I, I think maybe a little bit differently. And, um, and I think that when there's more people who are, you know, leading in that way or willing to uh, accept uh, a, 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 uh, group of folks like working together instead of just trying to be like oh so glory <laughs> you know let me stick a flag in it or pee on it or whatever <laughs> and I, I just it's like so much better than um like when we're a group you know and I think that that's how I try to lead and I try to show like you know I'm a servant leader I'm like somebody who's never been one of the like like I got to do it like my way or the highway, you know, kind of thing. I've always been like the person who's, um, you know, about trying to build those bridges and bonds rather than, um, you know, try, try to be the one that's the best or whatever. And I think that it shows um, and, and shows up uh, more and more as we are, are seeing these new uh, leaders come in that, uh, you know, it, that is much more powerful. It is more moving, I think, of people, and uh, and it's and it's also cultural, right? I think that as you're seeing more and more people of color run, you're seeing that you know they're bringing little pieces of who they are, and like in 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 you know uh, in a lot of different ways, 
uh, I think that that enriches our conversation and it makes it so that we have um, partnerships and coalitions and uh, ways of building that is the thing that's helping us to survive here now with this pandemic because all of the things that we've been fighting for um, when it comes to you know social benefits when it comes to um, a safety net when it comes to you know making sure that we have like you know the way that our neighbors have come together have been so powerful right because um, our federal government failed us our state government failed us our city government failed us and and mm -hmm. it's actually our neighbors that are helping out and the mutual aid that has popped up the uh volunteers that have come to i mean risk their own lives in order to help others has been the most powerful thing um that has been you know kind of the big saving uh thing uh within our communities right now and and I can't, I can't say enough thank yous to every, I mean, every single day that I've been out there, um, you know, just doing meals. It, it's crazy when I'm like handing out meals and all of a sudden I have like six people around me just like, hey, I'm going to help out, you know, and it doesn't, it's like, it's like, um, it's amazing. And it's like the people that, you know, you, you just met like or or somebody who you've known for a long time but you know like is taking a huge risk for themselves and like you're just like this is this is amazing and also just how coalition building and grassroots organizing can change everything right mm -hmm. and we've seen that with like bill after bill after bill and speaking of coalitions and servant leadership, I want to quickly talk about the Working Family Party and how it relates to the Democratic Party. <laughs> oh, this is a good question. <laughs> it's not what the answer to do, right? Because, um, you know, I think that as somebody who did run um, as Working Families Party only before, uh, mm -hmm. it is one that um, makes all the difference in the election to have an option. It's more, it's one of the only things that is democratic about our process. Um, <laughs> and like, I think that it's actually um, a big deal, right? To be able to vote your values. And for me, that's what the Working Families Party um, signifies. It's my political home and um, I am a Democrat. I'm also a Working Families Party person, right? Because uh, it is my values um, that, that, that they're talking about. Like they, they want to make sure that working people come first before corporations or profits. Like they want to make sure that we are actually uh, fighting for uh, fair wages and uh, making sure that everybody has healthcare and, you know, being, you know, basic things together to make sure that, you know, people are not left behind. And, um, and that's why, you know, for me, it's such a huge, deal to be able to try to help to preserve that line to make sure that people have that option because if the working families party didn't exist i wouldn't be here uh because i had to be an alternative uh option you know and the voters without having that option wouldn't have been able to um to know what i stand for hmm. wow i didn't even have tish james or diana richardson <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people of color are the are are the ones who run on the Working Families Party line. That's really good to know. It's and really something good to know. I was unaware of. Me too. I mean, like I'm in a little bit of a like we're obviously like a little bit nerdy about politics. That's why we're doing this. Um, but and and it's like I feel like really what we're doing is just like we're trying to learn, and like anybody who wants to listen can come along yeah. on the journey. But like <laughs> it's about us getting to know about y'all, um, and hmm, that's really that's just fascinating to know. I, I mean, I think. Because I've, I've always heard about the Working Families Party, right? Like when I was living in New York and voting in New York, blah, blah, blah. Like I heard about it and I obviously was like, I like what they're doing. But to know that they also are the reason that so many um, people of color are able to run and able to win these seats and able to provide representation yeah. just adds a whole new layer it does. to why we love them. It does. And why everybody listening should go Google the Working Families Party. Yes. <laughs> right now. Yeah, pause, no. pause this and go. <laughs> Right now they're, they're you know, always have new members. So please join. It's amazing. It's the best party. <laughs> it's always a party at that party. <laughs> hey. And you can definitely find some resources about the Working Families Party and some links in uh, at our website. And yeah. we will uh, mention that at the end of the show as well. Yeah, we are totally going to plug that shit. 
<laughs> and you know, just so you know, that very famous hoodie that uh, AOC wears, I wear, like the red one with the, the Working Family Party logo is still for sale on the website, so you can have one too. There I'm gonna get a hoodie upgrade. <laughs> I'm gonna upgrade from my gray to my red. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, where are we in this question? Where oh, have we gone? I got it. You I'm got it. Ready. Because I want to know, what are your top priorities for the citizens of the 65th district and how can residents get involved? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. Uh, one of the biggest things right now, obviously, is to raise revenue you know, in order to make sure to pay for everything. I mean, we have to talk about things within this pandemic and the situation that we're in right now. Um, as you probably have seen with my uh, budget speech that I made in um, in, in end of March, uh, beginning of April, uh, when we were passing the budget, I have been against austerity budgeting for a very long time. But one of the biggest things that I felt was the most sick um, was the cuts to our healthcare during a global pandemic, the cuts to our, our safety net uh, during a time when we've been needing our uh, safety net the most. And, um, you know, just some of the things that have been happening uh, on the ground, like we are seeing, you know, just this disparity of care and, um, you know, our, our uh, gig economy, the essential workers, the people that were clapping for every day at seven o'clock, like these are the folks who are left out of all of these different services that, um, you know, that the state is saying that they're trying to make sure that they can get, like they, you know, the unemployment, the uh, ability to be able to get um, hazard pay for some of our healthcare workers, the, um, you know, the uh, ability to be able to be included in any of the housing rent programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like you can go down the line and it's very, very hard to see where they can actually get the help that they need. And they're the ones who are helping to keep our economy running. They're the ones who are helping to keep us safe in our homes. And, you know, I think the other thing of course is rent. Um, it's the biggest expense here in New York City for the majority of folks who live here and as somebody who lived here, for like you probably also um, understand yes. like how much of a percentage of your um, of your income every single week like goes to rent, right? And so, uh, in this time period, so many people have lost their jobs. So many people's uh, entire businesses have been shut down by the government, by the way. And so, I feel like there's so many things that we have to take responsibility for because we're the cause of those things uh, changing for them, right? And so, uh, because of that. Um, we have to really be able to help people with uh, making sure that you know they are are able to have a home to stay in when we're telling them to stay home. <laughs> we're telling people to stay home. We're making the mandate, and yet if they don't have homes to stay in, then then then, then how are they supposed to be able yeah. to stay home? Something's got to give. Yeah. Something has to give. And and that's right. I think that you know we have to we have to do something about this whole entire issue. And so you know I have a bill that's uh, a lot of people probably know about it. It's called the uh, Mortgage and Rent Cancellation Act of 2020. Um, and I think that uh, it's really important to make sure that we are doing rent forgiveness and that we're helping to uh, we're helping to be able to bridge that gap for folks because. Uh, like you said, something's got to give. And if we were to be able to stop the dominoes from falling from here, then that will make it so that there's a cushion for the blow um, for everyone uh, down the line. And so and that's a huge difference from what a lot of politicians are promoting, which is just a freeze, which right. means that that debt is still going to be waiting for you. Right. And um, at I, the I, end of this, if you couldn't pay for your rent now, and then even if nine months later from now or 11 months later from now, or, you know, like your industry comes back or you're able to start up your restaurant again, or you're able to um, get your bartending job or your, your waitressing job again, like even after all that, like I would have to win the lottery to be able to mm -hmm. pay all that back. Like, even if I started a fans only page, like, and work three jobs and, you know, sorry, I <laughs> right. some, some shit no. today. Article. That was it's so true. Oh my god, that oh. pissed me off. Oh. Yeah, but that. like, like if, if if I was working all of the jobs, like I and and you know, was trying you know to make a miracle happen, it would it would take me winning the lottery and then some to be able to, mm. you know what I mean? Like right, <laughs> the lottery if I like you know with it like if they take it in taxes, you know, I couldn't even. <laughs> Help like that, that <laughs> right. yeah exactly like I'm you just, win the lottery and it all goes back to the government anyway so like I'm what's just the point? Saying, it's, it's so important to make sure that people understand that that lump sum of like say thirty four thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars or whatever it's 
it's going to be so hard for people to repay that we're mm-hmm. trapping people into a cycle of debt that they're not going to be able to get out of for over 10, 20, 30 years. And is that the economy that we want to build? And so if we are able to stopgap that now, that's a way that we can help to help our, rec- our, our recovery faster. Um, this is something that, you know, I say that over and over and over again, we should be investing in our communities rather than taking away from our communities. But, but like just, it's, it, I mean, in, in a microcosm and like in one small example is the food programs that we're running right now. People are like, oh yeah, you know, like the, the cost of like trying to do a whole new food prog- program, like the way that the city is doing with DIFTA and like trying to like contract these like giant companies, like the cost of it is actually costing people on the ground. And on top of that, like taxpayer money is going into these like big programs that are literally, you know, employing these giant corporations to do them. And, um, and then using like, you know, the wrong agency with the wrong, tra- like, it was just like, why is the Department of Sanitation running that? I mean, not to say that they, you know, props for being able to do what you did, um, honestly, but like, why, why then are they also using taxi cabs to do that? Like, I'm glad that they got something to deliver, but it wasn't the right people doing the right things, doing the right whatever. You know, it, it's just like there should have, it should have been that we were extra funding um, our social service programs who already had the kitchens, were able to make culturally appropriate meals, um, also already understood like what people's needs were health and dietary wise, um, rather than like having applesauce cookie cereal and, you know, whatever else that they were packaging in these things that were not culturally appropriate or, um, you know, edible for for most of the people who are needing things the most, including people who are like had diabetes, like you would die. Like if you right. had real failure, you would die. Like you couldn't eat these things. And so it was just like, none of these things made any sense. What we should have been doing was doing an expanded SNAP with no asset limits, you know? That made it so that, you know, if anybody was to take off the asset limits of SNAP, anybody could apply. There was no, um, you know, checklist of like things that you had to apply for and we could use it like cash and guess what? they could be supportive of our small businesses and stop that cycle of stopping, you know, stopping that cycle of making it so that our small businesses went out of business and didn't get uh, any kind of cash flow. Like what, like why, why couldn't we think a little bit further about investing in our communities and investing the, the money that we had, the billions of dollars that we had in funding into our communities rather than like starting these new programs that only enrich the, the rich and the corporate. Seems like common sense. It does. And this is what happens when you don't have representation mm-hmm. that is actually representative of the people. Exactly. Like I on I will just own it. Like if I was trying to represent the people that you represent, I would have probably fucked it up big time because I wouldn't have understood. I would not yeah. have understood like the needs. But you know, like yeah, because I don't know. Like I I happily eat applesauce and cookies. I shouldn't. I should like be better. But like I would not know. You know? <laughs> you can't have applesauce. But <laughs> I can't have applesauce. No, I mean, but like, right now, there is so much applesauce on the streets. <laughs> oh my gosh. There's like a, just unopened applesauce because that's what they put in every single one of these meals. Like, it's just like, what that is that? Outrageous. outrageous. I mean, so there's that, like, it's really at the top of like what the city paid for, you know? It's just like, yeah. great, you're paying, you know, however many dollars per meal. And yet, you know, what? You know, our small businesses here, like I'm, I'm doing a food program with my friend Patrick Mock, who runs 46 in Mott Street and like, and, 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 and there's a, a bunch of other restaurants like Tony's Rice Roll and like um, Kopitiam and like a bunch of other restaurants that have been just super helpful in helping to deliver food to the community. But at 46 Mott with Patrick, we are first, that was the first food program that I helped with. And it's to make sure that our small businesses like were able to get some help, but also mm-hmm. that, you know, they wanted to deliver nutritious and delicious meals that were culturally appropriate to our constituents and to the homeless, um, you know, neighbors that we have all over, you know, our area and all, all of our neighborhoods. And, and <laughs> it was, it was nuts. Like it costs only $3 per meal for us to make them. Um, and and then we were able to provide these meals for everyone. And, you know, every single person who got those meals, they felt happy. They felt satisfied. They were, um, they were hot. The meals were hot. And like, it, it made a huge difference, especially now in the winter time when we're still delivering, mm. you know, and they're, they're uh, so grateful for the fact that it's a hot meal and not another uh, carton of milk. Cold applesauce. Yeah. That they can't eat. That's terrible. So, how do the residents of the 65, 60, of the 65th, <laughs> how do the, re- 
how do the residents of the 65th district get involved? What can they do? They're already doing so much. My, yeah. my, my neighbors are like the best at all this. Like they've done community fridges. They've like, you know, helped to run a food pantry. There's an amazing group called uh, Vision Urbana who's like been helping with food pantry work. UJC yeah. has a food pantry here. Like, it, like, you know, all of these different groups have food pantries and have helped to like maximize the potential. Um, you know, all of the, uh, the resident associations, the ten, uh, ten, tenant association presidents have like really made a huge impact on trying to get deliveries out to folks. Um, you know, we just have to partner and like help out and like fill in like the holes, you know, cause we were at first, we were running everything and starting everything. They took over now. And like, really, we just like really helping to just dole out and plug where we can and like help out where we can. And we shifted a lot of our operations to um, really being support and helping to make sure that, you know, certain people can connect to get those resources out. Like a really good friend of mine, uh, Winston, who was a co-founder of this group, Rethink. And Rethink is amazing, by the way. They're still, you know, doing thousands and thousands and thousands of meals to my district. Um, and, uh, you know, Winston himself, like he's just this amazing person who's helped me to like make sure that, you know, homeless folks have socks, um, that people can um, get you know, very basic things like vitamins um, that, you know, we, we have like some food, uh, obviously, but, you know, it's other things too, right? And so, um, you know, we've just been doing some of the things to plug those holes, but let's be very, very real. The biggest thing right now is that we need to move the legislation, that we need to make sure that we are actually getting revenue, that we are generating revenue and taxing the rich to make sure that, you know, the people who have just literally made billions of dollars, like, can I just, I just want to reiterate this point, right? 120 billionaires in this state just made $77 billion more off of this pandemic. So there's something, something very, very um, wrong there, but also they can afford to um, help with our- uh, Sorry. Billion dollar deficit. <laughs> you said- so, $77 billion. Yeah. But it's only 120 people? 120 people. I'm going to do, hold on. I've got to pull up my calculator because I have some math to do. And this is just in the state of New York. Yeah. This is just in the state of New York. We have 120 billionaires. And I just, I, I mean, look. Is that billion the, or million? That's million. Okay. God, I don't, I've never even like seen that much money. My computer, you have to turn your, you have to turn it won't it. even do it. My calculator <laughs> won't even do it. There, oh God, One that, that's it. Oh my God, that's so many zeros. <laughs> divided by- 120. Where's my divide? Divide, <laughs> I suck at math. That's why I do podcasts. I mean, obviously it's not the- It's not you what? evenly amongst the billionaires, by the way. There's also no, but the like, if it were- it's not divided it, evenly, but- Right. But like, if it were, that's- <laughs> Over $600 million. Per person. That's just to, to fuel my rage about, <laughs> about, about the wealth gap in this country, though. <laughs> okay, sorry. I just had to yeah, do that for it's myself. Very extreme one. Yeah. It's insane. Especially if you think about that, that that's what they made within one year. Um, yeah. And close our entire state's deficit and make it so that we don't have to cut any programs across the board. It only <sighs> um, about not even 10% of that. Like, I mean, it's 10% of it. But yeah, that's it. It's crazy. It would barely affect them. To- it would not yeah, um, not just, at all. Not at all. Like, I mean, that wouldn't affect them at all. And I think that that affect their livelihoods. Like, it wouldn't affect their life of like having a dignified life. It wouldn't affect. I mean, it wouldn't even make you have to sell property or a yacht no. or something. Like, I don't. They just got it. They just literally got it. <laughs> so yep. it's not like they. But it, you know, what, but it I, could, it could mean the difference between having a dignified life and not for everyone else being dead. Yeah. Or a lot. Like, I mean, I'm just going to put that out there, right? You're like right. I found who was sitting in her own feces for four days because her home care worker had um, got, got COVID and had told somebody that they needed to change out her shift, but they had missed the email because there were so many people who were emailing. And when we made our wellness call, I found her in her mm-hmm. own shit for four days. And she had had a stroke, so she couldn't really ask for help or call for help to anyone her her phone automatically picks up and she could finally say something uh, and all she could say was help so oh my god i just want to put that out there for folks 
Um, and also the fact that I found one of my own professors uh, homeless, living out of her car, uh, and she's still teaching full time. So I just want to let people understand the troubles that we're in yeah, and yeah. how actually real uh, this is and that we have to ask for revenue and we have to do something about rent and we have to make sure that people are actually um, you know, able to stay healthy because we won't recover if everyone's dead. So I think that one of the things that we need to do is uh, galvanize people. And I think that my district has been very mobilized. Um, we have to make sure that folks like you help to get that word out, to mobilize more people and to get that, um, you know, that news out that this is what we need to seek. We need at least $10 billion raised in revenue this year, this fiscal year, not like later. Later, we'll still need another 20, okay? And like maybe 50, right? But like this, this right now, this vote right now, the next one on revenue, maybe coming up in December, um, we need to make sure that we are raising at least $10 billion for our state or else we're gonna experience devastating cuts, wow. devastating cuts. So it's actually the other districts. They need to call. They need to call their assembly person. And they need to make sure that they're voting. Yes, they need to call and call and call. Like they need to call the governor. They need to call the leaders. They need to call like everybody. And mm -hmm. uh, folks need to be mobilized. They need to be aware of what's going on in their neighborhoods and, and yeah. you know, fight for those things, you know, help with the mutual aid, fight for the, um, the funding that they deserve, you know, on the social services end, for the food pantries, for our settlement houses, for all of the folks who've been doing the work. You know, it's our settlement houses, you know, like Grand Street Settlement, University Settlement, Henry Street Settlement, you know, um, you know, the, the amazing Hamilton Madison house, like they're the ones who are actually going out there feeding people. Um, I haven't seen a single day where Henry Street hasn't had their little carts out feeding people, right? Like I haven't seen a single day when, you know, Grand Street hasn't, you know, held workshops for folks. I, I, like this is not, um, you know, we know where the work's being done. And, and yet, did you know that they, even the, the fully funded RFPs, the, the funding that we already gave out in other budgets, they're still, they're not getting paid out. Our social workers are not getting paid right now. There's people who are, who are literally, um, you know, missing funding. Like they're, they're not able to close out their fiscal year because the government has not paid them. It's shocking. Yeah, I, I just, the incompetence is outstanding. And people, please be annoying as shit to your representatives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, just like, bully them into doing the right thing because not everybody's as great as you Lynn. That's right. And not everybody's listening and like out there on the ground. I feel like I keep seeing these posts where it's like, oh, all of these nurses um, collected their, their PTO to give to the nurse that got COVID. So she didn't, cause she ran out of PTO and they're like, what a heartwarming story. And it's like, that's not heartwarming. That's disgusting that that's even a necessity in a pandemic or, you know, like, I don't even know all the other examples. Like, I I'm glad that we have neighborly values and that's amazing. And it is people protecting people like that's so great, but the government, that means the government failed. Mm -hmm. That means the government failed. And mm -hmm. I mean, what you just said was something that happens like every single day, like this woman who is this one of the best, people on the planet. She's a nurse. She's uh, working in one of the hospitals here. Um, she reached out to me and this is one of the people, this is, these are the folks that we brought food to. Patrick had helped, helped them to get food to the night shift um, in the hospital for over three months because, you know, everything is closed down at night, right, for the night shift. And my mom was a night shift nurse. And so I know that it's already hard on a daily basis to get takeout and all those things. It's hard, right, to even find places open. And so sometimes you have to, you know, eat very unhealthy or you have to bring your own food or whatever, right? So we were helping to make sure that they were getting food every single day for um, the most tough months of the pandemic. And, um, and, you know, she had reached out to me. She was actually going to use her own hazard pay um, to feed everybody. And I was like, that's not what we're doing. No. But that's where the government failed, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. because these shouldn't, these shouldn't even be issues. We shouldn't have to have these conversations because like, I, it's like everybody, uh, I, I, have, I mean, living in Texas, I live in a lot uh, with, you know, I know a lot of conservatives. I know a lot of very far right-wing people. My family's very right-wing. And the argument I can- I, You what? I grew up in El Paso too. 
Oh so, yeah. So, you so know, you know. <laughs> um, although I gotta say El Paso is like so left now, like they're really working on it. It's, they're, so they're, left. it's been, been democratic since forever, but yeah. I, that's when I, uh, like I told you, Ann Richards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but like, unfortunately my Texan reality is much different. Um, even being like right on the outskirts of Austin, like just that 30 minute drive to where I live is so different politically. Um, like you literally during the 2020 election watched as the Biden signs shifted to Trump signs. It was like this gross transition into my neighborhood, <laughs> like a nightmare, like a waking nightmare. Yes. But the argument I always hear is, well, I don't want the government to take care of me. Even Joe Biden is saying it. He's like, the people don't want the government to take care of them. It's like, that's not what we're asking. What we're saying is that we pay all of these mon these this money in taxes every year and you're spending it on SWAT level protection for the local police department corporate welfare yeah i mean corporate bailouts like all of this stuff it's not that we don't have the money it's that we are the, allocating it irresponsibly. yeah so poorly and that's a failure and it's, it's like nice. we elect people like you to go in and help us and well, we need more people for for um for the fact that this is a global pandemic Right, and mm -hmm. that this is a time when things are not like pull yourself up by a bootstrap. Like, right, this is a time when the government is asking and and uh, asking us to stay home. When the government has shut down small businesses, when the government has um, made certain decisions for public safety. By the way, I think that that's it, it's not wrong to do those things. It has actually. It, it's just that. I mean, granted, I think that now with, with the indoor dining things, like there's some things that could be better and our small businesses should be able to operate somewhat. But I do think that um, there are certain things that have been very, um, you know, harmful to our economy, but we don't have to make it so that it's harmful to the economy, right? We, sh we could have actually just if we were if we were really serious about shutting down the pandemic and stopping it, and uh, uh, if we really wanted to actually make the the change and the difference, like in, in on a real front, we we should have just paid people to stay home. Mm -hmm. We should have paid for the rents. We should have paid for you know uh, for their living, and we should have just paid people to stay home. Yeah. And in months, I think that we would be done. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's going to cost us even more now because if we didn't do anything at the forefront, that makes it so that recovery is exponentially growing, just like the cost of, um, just like the cost of the lives, right, mm -hmm. that we're seeing lost. So, um, you know, we're going to have to shut that again, and then we're going to have to, you know, have hospital personnel work those shifts again, and we're going to have to have government pay for those things again. And like, I just think that, you know, it's not about uh, taking care of, it's about making sure that uh, we're taking responsibility for. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And I think that those are two different things. And uh, one, I mean, being representing the district that actually uh, had 9-11 hit it, and also uh, Hurricane Sandy, I will say that there are times when the government does have to take responsibility for mm -hmm. the, um, the parts that uh, were affected of its country that, um, you know, that took the brunt of something that happened to it nationally, right? Yeah. And I think that 9-11 um, wasn't a, a New York City thing. It wasn't like mm. a state thing. It wasn't, it was a, a United States thing. Mm. Like that, that terrorist attack happened to us as a country. And so the country and the government needed to come and take care of the folks who sacrificed their lives to make sure that people were safe and okay and did all of the work and and now are having the healthcare problems that uh, that are going to cost their lives, their families, their lives, like everything, you know. And and I think that you know the government needs to take responsibility for that because we were paying for something that the government did, right? And like the, the government owes us for that. And so I, I think it's the same with this pandemic, right? Like the government needs to take responsibility for its people mm -hmm. and for the decisions that it's making on behalf of its people. And so that's where it's not like, oh, the government shouldn't like, you know, the government should take care of it. It's actually, no, no, the government should take responsibility. And, and I think that, you know, again, reiterate, <laughs> you know, two separate things, two different, you know, perspectives maybe to the same coin, but not really actually. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's a 
big difference. It's like, it's like really a huge difference between saying, you know, hey, uh, maybe we need to, you know, shift a perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to switch gears really quickly because we have some other really excellent questions that I want to that I want to talk to you about. Yeah. Um, but it's really hard to get off of this because it's so relevant. I know. I just want to keep. Uh, so you're a champion for the DREAM Act, which will help secure citizenship for undocumented youth who came to the U.S. as children. Could you elaborate on your support for the DREAM Act and what this means to an immigrant like yourself from an immigrant family? Yeah. So, I mean, my parents came here for educational opportunities. You know, I mean, they came, um, you know, like a friend of Reagan. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, at that time, they were uh, lucky to be able to have um, the ability to apply for citizenship. Um, and I think that uh, laws have changed a lot throughout time. And um, some folks were not as lucky as we were, but uh, I think that, you know, to me, um, you know, as somebody who lived in El Paso, Texas, and who lived in a border town um, where, you know, let me just frankly say this. When you live in a border town, you realize that borders came to the people that wasn't like, I don't know, right. like when you, <laughs> when That's you exactly right. People already lived there, and then the border... <laughs> Yeah, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this part of your family is this people's, and that part of your family is that people's, and you're just like, all right, I'm, all right. But when you live in a border town, you see how malleable that is, and you see like how strange that is, right? And um, and like I just remember like my aunt's restaurant was in Juarez, and like I was like, you know, I had to go like with my cousin. He had a license at 14, like so, because he was on the Mexican side, so he was just like, nah, 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 let's just drive and like go get like the crabs for the day and then we were like okay now I'm like waitressing at the restaurant like for like fun you know just like, it was just you know it was it was like such it's so it's a border town so like everybody was just fluid going back and forth back and forth back and forth and then um you know the the border was just like this this made up thing right in a lot of ways and now it's now it's like you know a talking point I, I, I don't know it's just so strange I guess like I guess like how to how to express that I don't know how to express that but um I just feel like uh you know when we're when we're talking about you know people who have contributed so much to our country whether it's like students who have you know uh you know gone through our public school system who have you know applied to schools here uh for college and then have contributed so much to our economy and yet you know not having papers like i have i mean it's it's crazy you know it's it's like this is something that you have to support it doesn't even make sense not to support it you know mm -hmm. it's an investment <laughs> like we already made it <laughs> and i think i think there's a misconception that like when you when you talk about dreamers that they are like 10 year old children and some of them are but I have personal connections with dreamers and they're 30 <laughs> like they are fully adult people yeah. contributing with jobs contributing to the U.S. contributing to the economy contributing in intellectual ways uh you know yeah these are I mean the, the fact of the matter is um they came as children right, um, right. people who have lived their entire lives in America and have uh, not only worked full time or paid all their taxes and exactly. like, all things and pay, paid sales tax. Like, you know, some people, you know, try to do like all the things that they could and, um, you know, are really economic drivers. And yet, yes. you know, we're, we're going to, I don't know, kick them out for something. Um, that's silly. That's silly. Um, it is to kick them out to places that they have not been and maybe they don't, ever or in years. They don't maybe speak the language. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're like, oh, I was there when I was like six months old. We'll go back to where you came from. It's like, I'm barely from there. Like I am barely from there. This yeah. is my home. Right. I mean, I, I came to America when I was six months old. So it's so funny that you said that because like my mom and dad literally came to America with thousand dollars and six suitcases and a baby that was six months old, not knowing even how to get formula for her, you know? And so like, it was, you know, th th the immigrant experience isn't an easy one wherever you're coming. Mm. I just yeah. think that it's like, um, it's, it's kind of nuts to try to, you know, to do that just for, for what reason when, you know, they're literally, they don't know anything other than America and like, it's, it's nuts. And, and people don't realize this also. Uh, you know, like I talked about how much I love my district, but also 
like I love our country you know I could I chose it like I still remember at seven years old I got my citizenship at seven and I like had to like say the American like pledge of, tell me the pledge of allegiance and sing like our little song and like I and they made me do that at the office and I felt like well I made a choice you know and I chose this country and when you're making a choice of that significance and it like sticks with you and this is your choice of your country like you could go anywhere but this is what you chose like that's a different kind of love altogether people don't realize that but also Definitely. the dream act is economically sound and really really smart like if you already as a country paid all these taxes to uh, educate all these people like then you know why are we not keeping them here to drive our economy forward like you have some of the smartest people like top journalists top scientists top mathematicians like they're all dream act kids like yeah. y'all, we have legislators who are dreamers we have like people who like literally i mean just like what is going on like why would you not want you know some of the best brain like trust like why would you want want why would you want brain drain like from this country you know like no mm -hmm. <laughs> so true okay i want to read a statement that you made about criminal justice reform real quick uh so you said we don't have a broken system our system is working exactly how it was designed hurting certain communities while allowing other communities to gain from our hurt. Only by reforming all of our systems can we have real change. Can you please elaborate on what you mean when you say reforming all of our systems? Well, um, I just think that what we uh, have as a system, uh, whether it is our criminal justice system, which is the most obvious one, um, whether it is our education system, whether it is our healthcare system, whether it is our government system, all of these things were built with um, a racist lens, with a lens that is uh, one that um, they could only see from at that time. And so the, the things that were supposed to hurt particular people, the things that were built in to, um, you know, to keep the racial prejudice, the, um, the sexism, um, all of these things, like they were all written in, they were built that way. This entire system was written a certain way to keep particular folks out of it. And, um, and I think that it's really important that uh, people understand that, that it, you know, this is not a broken system um, because people talk, say that all the time, like, oh, the system's broken or we need to fix that part of the system system and like you know that it, it we it, you know band-aid solutions won't work in this broken you know like this for this big of a you know mm -hmm. break in our system but it's like nah <laughs> it's just designed this way it was designed to hurt people it was designed like in a way that it benefited the people who wrote it who who created it and um and i think that you know the at, at you know for for a very long time we didn't have that representation and so we need to um have good representation. We need to make sure that everything's transparent and accessible and that people can actually have a say and then and then we change it for the people and we make it so that we are creating a system that is just and equitable and will be written to make things just and equitable. You know, and I think that that is what we need to do um, more and more as a body and, uh, you know, every single moment where we see it, we need to make those adjustments and those changes. And um, it's throughout, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, how our school system allocates resources, whether it's, uh, you know, whether or not, you know, we have a huge uh, disproportionate population um, of uh, black and brown people in our jails. Right, uh, it, it you know in comparison to the population outside of jails, right. right? And I think that you know these are these are things that are um, are sick. <laughs> uh, and and I mean I say this because you know so I'm a huge proponent of taking uh, asset limits off of our social programs. Right. Um, I think it's really important that people understand that you know. And right now, it's always, <laughs> the fight is always like, oh, you know, so-and-so, what if they don't deserve it? Like, what if they don't, they don't need that help? You know, what if, and, and then the same thing with the rent conversation, what if they can pay the rent and they still they won't pay it? You know, it's like, people are going to take advantage of the system. And all right, like, but really, like, I mean, we can see the article after article 
article after article, study after study after study. Like people who don't need it usually don't take it. You know, people who you know our 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 benefit systems haven't been taking been taken advantage of. And when it is taken advantage of, it's usually not a person of color. It's not usually a person who you know is a woman or a single mom. <laughs> Whatever. It's like that whole like welfare queens thing was a racist yeah. stereotype right and and i think that you know that kind of concept that kind of thinking is an entitled one and it's like from the people who have the power that are saying that these people who don't have that power should not get any right and should not have you know um should not have any resources to be able to get a leg up or to be able to get any help and i think that um you know, taking, and people don't realize the economics parts of it either, right? Putting these asset limits on things also causes for people to have to do administration. So, like, you can't have things both ways to where people are, you know, stopping folks from getting into these social benefit systems and then also have, like, a government that's not, like, overseeing everything, right? And so, like, I just think that it's just, like, it's so controversial, right? It's so, like, silly and um, you're just like, okay, well, uh, why don't we just take the asset limits off and then we save all this money in admin and the money continues to go directly to people. And then guess what? Billions of dollars that we're spending um, just to administer and to stop people from getting into programs. Maybe a, a little bit will go to people who are taking advantage, but that's going to cost way less than it is to administer it mm -hmm. and to stop people. So just an FYI, I just, I just think that the economics of it are silly, the, the ways that things are moving are silly and, and it's everything that's built in, like instead of like doing this like voucher program system for housing where it excludes people, it's all about exclusion, right? It's like, these are the people who are included and these are the people who are excluded. Like we should just make it so that, you know what, the government takes care of rent. Like it just, I don't, I don't understand like why, you know, it has to be this like, you know, inclusive, exclusive thing, but people are so used to these systems working this way that we can't think outside of the box. We can't, that's the thing. We can't think, yeah, it's, it's like people are like, this is how it's always been done. This is how this program has worked. This is how like, you know, things should be going. But yet study after study after study, um, thinking outside the box have, have proven them wrong, right? Whereas like, why aren't we looking at other examples of like the fact that Taiwan's had universal healthcare and guess what? How many deaths did they have during this pandemic? seven and like we've had hundreds of thousands right and 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 the cost to them is way smaller right so economically it doesn't make any sense singapore they have more public 98 percent of their housing is public housing they're one of the richest countries like you why would why would we not per, per capita right like why right. would we not think that we would want individuals in our country to do well right and yet we have divested and you know you know, disinvested in our public housing system to where, you know, it's become dilapidated and harmful, right? And so we need to make sure that, you know, when we're saying, oh, public housing, it's like, no, actually look at Singapore, like 98% of their housing is public housing. That is a program that has worked and has made sure that people can live in great conditions and like, and, and has also taken stress off of housing so that people could be, you know, entrepreneurs and like creative thinking and like benefiting their own like country and government like it's just it's so it's so convoluted right and then you have like you know countries like sweden where they're like all about social benefits you have like countries like that just like do all these different things and yet we're just like stuck in our little lane saying like well we got to keep these people in we got to keep these people out like you know how do we help to make sure that people are not taking advantage of this it's like or you just give it and then there's less talk in the end Okay, I'm gonna throw a question at you that I hate, but it's the one, not even a question. Um, I'm gonna throw the, the argument that I hear a lot because I have this conversation with so many people um, and I try to keep it civil and a lot of times I fail. Um, Never. <laughs> but um, it's, it's because they throw, this, they throw this back at you and it's like, well, that works in other countries, but it'll never work in America because we're too big. What's your response to that? <laughs> the face. <laughs> same that's all I can manage is just like a scowl I'm like I don't what do you shut up she takes out her magnifying glass and looks at them very closely <laughs> uh, I don't know I mean there are so like I, look <laughs> um yes we are big we're diverse we have so many different points of view and like you know I this is like where 
yes, that's a good argument and not a good argument, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that because we're so big, um, <laughs> I think that we have more of a um, opportunity to be able to actually implement big change. The more that we're able to, <laughs> and by the way, we're not the biggest country in the world <laughs> by population or by land mass. <laughs> I mean, if you're not counting on Alaska. <laughs> Yeah, damn it, Alaska. Well, you know, Alaska is a state, but they have like such a small population, and yet the landmass is large. And so, like, yeah, you have to be like a oh, landmass or population. You know, what, what do they mean by large, right? So, right. I mean, yeah, Texas is larger than a lot of countries. I get it, but like, you know, population-wise, it's not right. So, I think that um, I think that's it's that's an interesting argument. We're a very diverse country. We're a very large country, and we have a lot of different perspectives. And so I think that this is where we can actually think of things um, even better because we have so many different perspectives and that makes it so that all of our policy can be layered and nuanced the way that it should be. And um, I, I personally am a person who says this a lot too, but I, I think that there is no right or wrong on policy. There's just um, perspectives. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you could come from a perspective completely different from me. Um, and just like your neighbors, when you're driving past and you're seeing like all these Trump signs, well, you know what, their perspective might be different, but maybe, you know, there's something about the issues that you care about that are the same. And mm -hmm. you might be facing the same issues and you might have different lenses to come out of it, right? Um, some people might think like, wow, you know, um, you know, what I'm looking at, uh, say for example, payday lending. So I regulated the payday lending industry out in Washington state. Um, and, you know, we put together a national bill for it and all those things, but payday lending is a predatory practice that uh, is all about, you know, trying to do small dollar short-term loans um, and, uh, you know, folks take them for emergencies sometimes. And then um, also uh, the interest rate is incredibly high, incredibly predatory, and it causes uh, people to fall into a cycle of debt that they can't really get out of. So, so this product itself is very, very dangerous, but, you know, there's an argument to be had for folks who needed it and who couldn't get any banking traditionally, right? And, um, or are having a hard time getting it, right? Because every single person who takes out a payday loan is actually banked. So it's not like they are unbanked people, but there are unbanked people who need products too. And sometimes they use loan sharks, right? So like, this is like the legal loan shark. And so in New York, we've banned the practice altogether. So that's a good thing. But in other states, um, we have it. And so, but the perspective is that sometimes people need those products, right? Or, or need something to be able to provide liquid capital to uh, somebody in an emergency. And, um, and sometimes people have so many emergencies that they, um, that they need some extra help, right? But, but there's, there's also the perspective of this. Like when you're looking at the system as something that is built to harm and when you're seeing it in a different way, you can see that, wow, just because it's the only product that services these communities um, these folks don't want to regulate it, right? Uh, but what makes you think that that's right, that those are the only products that service your community? That's racist. <laughs> that's yeah. not right. That's built in for, for failure. That's, that's starting you at the uh, place where you're undeserving of uh, the same products as everybody else. Um, that's making it so that, you know, yes, like I get it. When you walk into a Chase Bank in Harlem, it's very different from walking into a Chase Bank in the financial district. Over here in the fi financial district, when you're walking into the Chase Bank here, it is, you get to see, you know, Osamu no Uchi. You get to see like, you know, world-class art being displayed on the walls, right? And, and people are, hello, like, can I get you something to drink? Do you need a cup of coffee, a little bit of water, some seltzer, you know? And, and over in, in uh, Chase, uh, in Harlem, same Chase Manhattan Bank, right? Walk in, it's like plexiglass, bulletproof glass, and an ATM machine, and everybody there is just like, you know, behind the glass, and you can't even talk to them without shouting, right? It's like, it's a very, very different you know, way of banking and it's a different perspective on, you know, how, how people are treated. And so of course they're going to feel unwelcome. And guess what? Like when, you know, when, when they see that, you know, that's really hard and difficult to, you know, even walk in, like, that's not going to be the first place they're going to go for a long. So like, that's, it's just the way our system is built. Right. But there, the banks are also thinking, well, there's no incentive 
right? To, it's like they're, the, the biggest thing is that, oh, these people are not going to ask for a mortgage. They're not going to ask for a different product. They're going to ask for, you know, uh, cash uh, at an ATM. So like, let's just provide the ATM. But that's, that's like cyclical thinking that is messed up, right? Where we've actually seen that with our credit unions, with, the, um, with our community development, uh, you know, funds and uh, all of these different programs, like that actually um, people of color, women, um, the people who are big banks are traditionally not lending to are the ones who repay back loans the most. And we saw that with the payday lenders as well, right? Like that they are the ones who are always trying to pay back the loan the most. Nobody takes out a loan that they don't think that they can repay, right? And so these are, that's how the, the payday lenders get folks, right? And so it's all about perspective and about like how you think about something, but there's no wrong perspective. Of course, it's all right, right? Like it's like, somebody who supports the payday lending industry saying that it's the only uh, thing that's like out there that is servicing our communities isn't wrong. It's just that, is that all we deserve is the question that they should be asking at the end of that, right? And, and then so like to make good policy, we have to think of all of those perspectives. We even have to think about the industry and how they're saying like where we're pro providing something that's needed. Right. And so like, like when, when you're looking at all of these different perspectives, that's the only way that you can make good policy. Right. That's the only way because everything is layered and everything's all about like, you know, how to solve the biggest problem of all, which is, you know, at that point um, in this issue, it would be, uh, you know, making sure that everybody has equal lending opportunities. Yes. Mm -hmm. Incredible. You, <laughs> Kathleen's going to be so mad at us. I know. <laughs> Every time we're like, <laughs> you, want you. you what? I'm very wonky and I apologize. No, you're not you're wonky. You're not wonky. You're we're, amazing. We we're just get <laughs> like starstruck by you. And it takes, it takes time for me to fully process everything you're saying because it is so, it's so dense and it's so powerful mm -hmm. and it's so important. And Kathleen keeps coaching us to not just stare at the guests when they say powerful things, but to like pick up and be like that brings me to another topic but yeah. sometimes it's just really, it's hard. Just really hard she's just she's really cool <laughs> you just you like say these really impactful things and we have imposter syndrome so we're like mm -hmm. self-deprecation yeah um you're awesome so you're, you're, well, <laughs> <laughs> um so let's let's just shift gears into we, we we like to end our our interviews with like rapid fire silly questions that have nothing to do with policy or, or politics or government workings. Um, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna ask you them. They're gonna be random weird questions and just give us what comes to mind. Okay. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's great. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Okay. Describe yourself in three words. Uh, I think it would probably just be um, a dog person. Oh, Ooh, good. I love that. I love, <laughs> I love that so much. I would also say thoughtful, empowering, an advocate. Mm. Those would be my words for you. <laughs> I appreciate that yours was a sentence. Yes, I love that. That was great. A dog a person. Dog person. Um, <laughs> who is, um, who's a role model in your life? Uh, my mom. Yeah, my mom is my biggest uh, role model. And uh, my grandma, I guess, like would be like, you know, my other biggest role model. They're both amazing, powerful uh, women who maybe were born in the wrong time and place. Uh, but they were just like people who I've seen persevere through almost anything. And I think that that is amazing. I also wish that they didn't have to. <laughs> but I think that that's also part of what makes them great. What is the best breakfast place in New York City? All of New York City? You can just do your district. It's a big city. Yeah. In my district, it's huge. Um, just, uh, I'm a foodie. Uh, I don't know how, I, I don't know if you know about this, but I am a mad foodie. There's a reason <laughs> why I'm like moon based and around. Um, <laughs> I, love, I love food. And um, okay, so I would say uh, the tofu pudding at 46 Mott is amazing. It's a great uh, breakfast snack. Uh, the uh, Kamhing Bakery has these sponge cakes that you can just eat like a million of. I get a dozen and I eat probably like two thirds of them in one go. Um, I'm sick like that. 
I love uh, kanji. So there's a bunch of different little kanji places around for breakfast um, and always get extra fried donut sticks. So the plot twist is that this podcast is a front of a political podcast, but we really are just in it for the food recommendations. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will take anyone around who wants a food rack. <laughs> okay, perfect. We'll see you. We'll see you in New York. We're gonna come eat at all of these places, and then in two or three years. In two, three, <laughs> in twenty years, when the pandemic is over. No, it's not gonna be that long. This is outdoor dining, so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what is the biggest lesson you've learned from your time in government? Hmm. The biggest lesson I've learned in the last 20 years that I've worked in government is that I think what I said, you know, that there's no wrong perspective, that it's really about understanding where people are coming from and the experiences that they're walking from and, um, and to be patient about uh, how to um, navigate everybody's perspective because I think that a lot of times uh, people also need to understand that you have a perspective too and um, and that might be different and it's also coming from where you've walked right and I think that talking to each other and communicating is so important for uh, for changing hearts and minds and I think that that's okay and it's actually what makes um, democracy so important. What are you reading right now? <gasps> oh Oh, should I pull it out? Yeah, do it. Yes. Hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> this is such a fun interview. I love her. I'm having such a great time. I love her. Oh yes, Dang. there's a pile, there's a stack. There's a huge stack, are you kidding? Like I have <laughs> never ending books. I can read like so many books at the same time because I actually like read so much, but I love fiction um, and I don't get to read fiction as much as I, 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 I want, but obviously, um, you know, yeah, I, 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 I almost got suspended from school for reading, I'll just put it that way. What? What? Yeah. What so, a strange... <laughs> right? uh, well, so I, I guess I, I read a lot in other classes, like when I shouldn't. Oh. And so the teacher said that I was being distracting. And so, I mean, even though I was, you know, answering everything correctly or whatever, but my mom actually fought for me and said, like, the education system and the point of it is to help kids learn, right? <laughs> it's just like, you're, you're, yeah, she's just like, don't you want to encourage people to read? Like, it was a very strange conversation, but they made me uh, have to uh, return all of my books on Monday morning and I could only check out books Friday after school. So I could only read on the weekends. And so I became very fast at reading mm. and, you know, just like picked up a lot of like speed reading skills, I guess one would say, but I didn't even realize that they were like speed reading skills. I was just like, I wanted to finish the story before I had to return it on Monday morning. And wow. so, yeah, so I, I was like, yeah, <laughs> big on reading. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna have you back on to talk about all the ways the education system in this country is broken and messed is, up. Yes, because that is a perfect example. Oh, okay, what are you reading? Show us, walk us through it. I can't even wait to tell you about like my remedial class. That was like the best class I've ever taken in my life. All right. Oh. So I love Amy Tan. Um, I think that she's great. Obviously, a lot of people love Amy Tan, but uh, this was one that I just like. I was just rereading because I wanted to reread it for no reason at all. It was just one that I just like picked up yesterday night to reread because it's sitting in my closet. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, obviously our, one of our favorite <laughs> people on the planet. Um, I just wanted to pick up another one of his books, um, obviously, and just read it. Uh, and you know, I didn't really get to finish reading this, so I I am just reading it and felt like you know, it would be great because I love comedians and I love their perspective of how, you know, especially uh, political comedians and people who have, uh, you know, thoughts that really kind of dive into uh, some of the things that we're facing every single day, right? Mm -hmm. And and their, their take on it and the way that he takes apart things is like really brilliant, right? Yeah. Same with Apple. Can can you, can you go back and read the titles just for our, our listeners who are only listening sure. on the podcast? <laughs> so Amy Tan's uh, The Valley of Amazement. I actually have almost all of her books in my 
in, in my uh, bookshelf. I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Amy Tan, of like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Like these are my favorite authors. Like, and, and obviously um, I just actually packaged and I'm giving away um, Maxine Hong's uh, The Woman Warrior, who I have like six copies of her book because I've read it throughout my life and I like to make notes and all of them. And so I gave, I'm giving away a copy to one of my kids. And so, uh, so yeah, so I love Amy Tan. So I have a couple of her books. My sister actually got a bunch of them signed for me. So I was just like, oh, you know, kept them all. Um, but I just think that she's an awesome writer. Uh, obviously, you know, this one is uh, W. Kamau Bell and uh, it's tales of a 6'4 African-American heterosexual cisgender left leaning asthmatic black and proud blurred <laughs> mama's boy dad and stand-up comedian the awkward thoughts of and so I think that he's awesome he's fun um, and you know his takes are hilarious right he tackles racism he tackles um, you know being a nerd which is great and then being a nerd of color which like I so associate with you know and so I think <laughs> <laughs> I just think that, you know, it's, it's kind of great that he is, you know, this person who uh, is able to kind of talk in that perspective and, uh, and just give us a little bit about him, right? I think that it's so uh, strong. And also, like, I'm in an interracial relationship as well. And I was not always in a, uh, you know, uh, cisgendered or uh, straight heterosexual relationship. So like, this was, this has been, a you know, obviously something that uh, you know, something to also think about. And so like, these are all, all things that are, um, are cool, you know, to read about. And, and, you know, people have different perspectives. And so uh, one of my favorite comedians of all time, who everybody should know about is Ali Wong. Um, people say that I talk like her, but I think that she's way better than me, obviously. <laughs> I, I just think that, you know, some of the things that she's thought, I've definitely thought, like, like let's be very, very real. <laughs> Um, some of the things that she said, I was just like, well, yeah, I've definitely uh, <laughs> been there, right? Um, and I think that she's uh, hilarious and just one of the most brilliant uh, comedians of our time. And I'm so glad that, you know, people have discovered her or like found her funny and, uh, and it makes it so that I, don't, I get in trouble a lot less, so. <laughs> so that's Dear Girls by Ali Wong. This is a letter to her daughters and um, mm. the book that she wrote to her daughters. But actually, you know, what was really beautiful to read was the last chapter, which is actually her husband's letter and responding to the things that her, uh, what their, their, um, their mother wrote. So oh. it's beautiful. I highly, highly suggest it. It's, it's quirky. It's funny. It's, it's like watching her comedy. And mm -hmm. of course, like the writing is funny, but it's just, it's a quick, quick read, but it's one that um, tackles a lot of things for strong women um, mm -hmm. who uh, obviously uh, have to navigate a lot of things in a different way because there's no, you know, there's no stereotype for us yet. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a path. Yeah. And so this one is another book. This is my, my partner gave to me for my birthday. Um, it's a Kawakami book um, called Breasts and Eggs. And um, I am a huge uh, Haruki Murakami fan. And he thought this book was good. So I'm just going to start it very soon. And so I love his writing. Um, and so I'm very excited about her writing because I I read short stories that she wrote, but I have never read this novel so I'm gonna be able to start it it's called breasts and eggs so I'm really excited about it um but yeah I love books wow. I love them. awesome we just all oh. sitting right behind me because they were like the ones that are in my living room right now for that's perfect I got so excited your face lit up when we asked about what you're reading and you took off for the book pile I was like yes this is a good one <laughs> I love reading I can't oh, help, you know? that's Those good I love it I'm always searching for them yeah. yes I me too I'm always like on the look for I'm like a like a book hoarder like I have more books than I have space for like but they're like lined up with my plants and they're lined up in my closet and they're like stacked up on like all of my tables I have a problem Same. Same. Um, I have, so like that's the only thing I spend money on <laughs> me too I'm like addicted I have a book shopping addiction I've got a list on my Amazon account called books I want to buy because I have to ration myself <laughs> um, I, I mean look I, I think that's the one thing that anybody should be willing to spend uh money on I have ne like so I have a Kindle but I've never been willing to actually use it like mm -hmm. I, I, I find it very difficult somebody gifted it to me but I I just I, I just love the feel and the smell and the holding of books and like I literally can't 
yeah, I can't part with them. It's a hard thing, but I do love gifting my books away too. Sometimes it's like one of those things. It's like, like when a person needs your book, it's okay. <laughs> That's the only time they leave my hands. <laughs> you, you are speaking to my soul right now. I feel like we're all really bonding <laughs> over, over books. This. Just a bunch of book nerds talking <laughs> yeah. on zoom. <laughs> um, so what are you, what are you most inspired by? Um, I think I'm right now at this moment, I'm most inspired by my neighbors. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the stuff that they're willing to do and things that we're all like pushing for and that we're fighting for every single day um, during this time has been so inspiring. And um, when I get tired and I'm, I will admit, I am very tired after fighting uh, for so long and so hard uh, every single day, this, this has been really hard to swallow a lot of the things that um i've seen and had to do like have been very traumatic and so i um i haven't even sat down to like deal with it all and i know that you know every time i speak about it people are just like that's really traumatizing and i'm like yeah it is and then i have to like think about it and i'm like oh yeah so now i'm just saying like out front <laughs> yes a lot of the things were very traumatic it's traumatic to see you know uh see people that you know uh become homeless and then to see people who you um you care about pass away and to like see those fridges full of bodies and like to see like you know um your constituents just struggle every single day and like to see how long these food pantry lines are and to see how long your food line is and to and to even like think that that like basic need is not fulfilled is like heartbreaking and um and so like you know I think that my neighbors like when they're out and when I see them pushing and pushing like that gives me energy and gives me strength and like gives me that impetus to like get up in the morning because sometimes I'm just like I can't see anymore I just I, I don't want to I don't even want to watch it happen anymore and like and then you have like folks like on their TikToks and their Instagrams like baking bread and starting like sourdough starters and I'm just like I want that life but I'm not that life and like I just I think that you know it just it makes me feel like everything's topsy turvy, but you know, having having the people around me being so amazing makes me want to like you know keep going. So that, they inspire me every day. What is the most impactful advice you have received? Hmm. So I think the most impactful advice that I have ever received still comes from um, my mentor Uncle Bob Santos. He uh, is, a, is a civil rights um, activist out in Seattle and he passed away not too long ago but uh, he was also Sharon Tomiko's husband <laughs> and so um, I lived at their house basically like every single day they were like going through all my stuff and they even went through my resume line by line and all those things like I said pulled out clothes from her own closet to dress me. Um, but the, the biggest thing that he ever said to me that actually made me change perspective on who I am and what I can do and, and has been something that I've been telling people over and over and over again um, because it changed me so much is that you can lead from anywhere. Right? You don't need a title. You don't need an office. You don't need a table. You don't even need a pen. Like you can lead from anywhere. And there's a lot of different kinds of leadership. And, and the world needs all of them. And so, um, you know, like it's okay that I am uh, a weird <laughs> introverted person who uh, is on the autism spectrum, who, um, you know, has like very specific interests and like can be very dogged at times and just like, you know, all the things that I am, it's okay. And, uh, and it's okay because like the world needs it. And, um, and it's okay because I can lead from wherever I'm at and however I'm comfortable leading um, is a powerful and impactful leadership style. Uh, I am, like I said, I'm not the top down mentality. I, am, I don't even have a hierarchy in my office, right? Like my staff are just like, what's wrong with you? Like we need an intervention about your thing. You know, like, <laughs> like we don't have any of the, any of the traditional things that I, um, I think like a lot of people have in their offices and like I am not, somebody who um, can even, uh, you know, be like 
the loudest spoken person in a group you know I I am the person who pushes from behind and I am also a person who's always serving like uh in my office like you know guess who's cleaning all the time <laughs> it's me like, I take out the garbage I clean the floors you know and like I, I build the walls and like you know build the furniture and so like it's like I, like I just think that you know um I'm a you know different kind of person and like leader and I just I never thought of myself as a leader because I you know I think that we internalize all the time that um a leader is like the president like the person who speaks in the front of everyone or like the person who's like a charismatic leader in a nonprofit, or like you know the person who's like the the like the person who's like always on the megaphone or you know whatever right and I think that we internalize that kind of leadership as leadership and we have to break that like I mean I think that that's just not something that's true and I saw that with Uncle Bob like he led through karaoke you know he led through like fun and then there's like yeah he was a karaoke star I love your faces by the way um he he sang Frank Sinatra and like got people to fall in love right and I think that um I got to see uh people like Bob Cattell who you know he's he's also you know somebody who I uh, got to meet uh, through my mentorship program at uh, at CUNY Baruch Bearcats yay I even have the cup um, but yeah it's just like one of those things where uh, he actually was somebody who thought outside of the box and even though you know you would think like he's somebody who I would you know obviously you know, at, as somebody who's like, oh, I want to hug all the trees. Like he's somebody who worked in at, uh, natural gas, right? He's a CEO of natural gas company, Brooklyn Union Gas, which now is National Grid. Um, and uh, he's like, but he's an inspiration to me because of the fact that, you know, he uh, he's also not like one of those people who's like, I'm going to be the loudest in the room to be the charismatic leader and like blah, blah. He's actually somebody who thinks about um, community impact. And he actually was somebody who did every single job before he became the CEO because he wanted to know how how it looked and felt. And, uh, and you know, and uh, he's, he's incredible, you know? And I think that there's, there's something to be said about leadership that's like about organizing your people and loving your people and like always fighting for your people. And um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of different kinds of things. And that's why Uncle Bob's words still stay with me today. And that's why I still say them all the time to my staff, to the folks who I work with, to like the young people and obviously on podcasts. <laughs> so, podcast like this like one this one <laughs> okay so it's very serendipitous that you brought up uh uncle bob and karaoke because our last question for you um you know we we are aware that part of your career was spent in winnie's karaoke bar and the bush garden in seattle at the karaoke. yes that's <laughs> uncle bob like he held all of his political meetings and so therefore i was also the i was the karaoke host on tuesday night so being a karaoke host, you have heard a lot of music. Yes. And I want to know, what is one karaoke song that you never want to hear again? Ooh, um, anybody singing Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> <laughs> Worst choice ever. Nobody can sing it, right? Nobody can sing it like they do. And it is seven minutes long. It's awful. Talk about trauma. And everybody picks it. Yeah. It's oh. always, I'm going to say it out loud. It's always white dudes who think that they can do it. Oh, and it it's like, dude, why? 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 Like, Queen is epic, you know? Like, yeah. they're here. Like, don't do that to Queen. Mm -mm. All right, folks. If you learn nothing from this interview, learn this. <laughs> Karaoke hosts like literally will pretend they lost the disc <laughs> i don't know we don't have queen here it's so weird sorry can't yeah sorry <laughs> we can't find it anywhere so it's seven minutes long guys that's like that's the, too many minutes too yeah. many minutes like by like three and a half minutes it's too many minutes by three and a half minutes mm -hmm. and i feel like like karaoke bar is just like synonymous with like drunk people like you have to be like a certain level of of wasted to get up there at all um like i don't i like we're literally like i and it's like every day like seven yeah. times a day you know there was this um I i'm like a true crime fan and there was this whole series of murders called the my way murders in the philippines 
because yeah. and it yeah. has nothing to do with the song, but like people were like singing My Way by Frank Sinatra and people yeah. would get angry and kill them because it was so bad and so frequent. I, 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 I talk about the story all the time. And this is why I say like, you know, Uncle Bob, he's that great because he sings my way and it's great. And people applaud and people in the Philippines were like, yes. You know, Cause he's first off he's Filipino, but he's also like great. You know? And he's the exception to the my way murder rule. Yeah, well, so, I mean, look, if you're gonna sing Frank Sinatra, you better sing it well. Right. <laughs> right. And by the way, the Philippines love Frank Sinatra and they take karaoke so seriously that that's why it happens. I used to work on cruise ships and a vast majority of the crew are Filipino and they are the nicest people and they do, they do. They love their karaoke. They're I mean, talented too, you know? They are, they're the wicked talented. You know, is a Filipino guy, guy who like, like literally was just like picked up off the YouTube or something. I don't even know. I like picked up yeah. off the like me social media or something, but he's like literally from Africa, you know? Uh, wow. <laughs> there you go. I mean, and there you have it. And there you have it. <laughs> don't sing Bohemian Rhapsody, but if you feel like you've got the chops. Badly. <laughs> especially not badly. <laughs> Go ahead. So to close us out, is there anything that you mm. are, are dying to share or to talk about? You really want to ha have hit home for, for our listeners, for people listening in on this hilarious conversation. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what should what what uh what hasn't been covered we covered a lot of stuff I we like... did there was one thing that we missed that I was excited about which was the climate and community protection act like how does the green new deal aid your efforts in New York and and like how, what does that look like in comparison yeah I mean right now is the time to do it right like we are needing jobs and like the things that are going to help to invest in our communities like we could do things that will help us in the long run I mean one of the biggest things when I was working for the EPA um, under Obama because there's no EPA under Trump it was like a stool like like a thing for the fossil fuel oh. <laughs> I don't even know I don't know what the, oh. I don't understand. But anyways, um, when I was working for the EPA, um, one of the biggest things that we were fighting for under uh, Obama, under Lisa Jackson, who was the administrator, um, was to uh, know the difference like between um, environmentalism and uh, environmental justice, right? Environmental justice is actually what helps our communities the most and like helps to talk about something called environmental segregation. People don't even realize that it's happening, but like think about the fact that like, uh, right along the uh, highways, right? That's where usually our uh, public housing is. Why? Because they knew that the air wasn't gonna be healthy for people to breathe. And so it's very sick. And, um, and yeah, and so there is another book that I was reading uh, not too long ago. And sorry, I read a lot. Um, and I love it. A really, really amazing book. I'm gonna go grab it really quick so I don't fuck up the title. Perfect. No, yeah, go grab I it. Love that. We've kept her so long. I know. I feel bad. I keep looking at the like the clock because I don't want to like disrespect her time. But, I know, but also, I, love her. I would talk all night. I would. <laughs> yeah. sleep over. It is called a terrible thing to waste, and it is uh, on environmental racism and its assault on the American mind. And it's basically talking about IQ and um, the loss of IQ due to environmental segregation. And so, um, you know, there's a bunch of things that the book covers and. You know, it talks a lot about, you know, lead pain. It talks about um, blood lead levels um, and like what it does for, uh, what it does to women and uh, to children and uh, especially black and brown kids and um, Asian kids when it comes to like certain things. Like, so, uh, you know, one of the things that, it, you know, they, they do is like they list these did you knows and I, I'm gonna read a couple to you, but they're really horrific. But, um, when swallowed a lead paint chip, no larger than a fingernail, can send a toddler into a coma. One-tenth of that amount will lower his IQ. Nearly two of every five African-American homes in Baltimore are plagued by lead-based paint. Almost all of the 37,500 Baltimore children who suffered lead poisoning between 2003 and 2015 were African-American. Middle class of African American households with incomes between 50,000 and 60,000 live in neighborhoods that are more polluted than those of very poor white households with incomes below $10,000.
a study found that children around age 10 who had been exposed to air with high levels of black carbon, soot, suffered a decreased cognitive function across assessments of verbal and nonverbal intelligence and memory construct. About 69% of Hispanic children, 68% of Asian American children, and 61% of African American children live in areas whose air quality exceeds EPA ozone standards compared with only 51% of white children. When it comes to Alzheimer's, air pollution has become a prime suspect. African American rates of Alzheimer's are as much as 100% higher than those of whites constituting what the Alzheimer's Association calls a silent epidemic among black Americans. A PCB concentration of just five parts per billion in a pregnant woman's blood equivalent to one drop in 118 bathtubs full of water can have adverse effects on a developing fetal brain giving rise to IQ deficits. So the chemicals that people are putting into the air, into the water, into um, you know, the segregated uh, you know, products that people are actually using. So, I mean, this goes into even beauty products. So if you're buying beauty products at the store, like I'm so glad for, um, you know, the fact that Fenty exists, you know, that um, there's a couple of different products now that actually go and market to, um, you know, communities of color that are actually more high end because some of the comedogenic numbers for some of the uh, cosmetics when it comes to, um, you know, drugstore products is so high and so disturbing, but the, the only, you know, people who have ever marketed towards uh, darker skin tones or towards uh, communities of color um, have been uh, in drugstore products because they don't believe that people of color can buy expensive products. Um, it's very disturbing. Um, they think that, you know, uh, they're, they're not marketed for us, right? And so uh, I don't know about you, but um, when it comes to my own skin tone, like for cosmetics, I need to use two different products to mix it. So like, it's like, it's, it's actually very difficult to um, kind of even pinpoint all of the different disparities. And so this is why I say, you know, again and again and again, that our systems were not uh, built for us, that actually, you know, these are not things that are broken. These are things that are by design. People designed our public housing next to our highways because they knew, Robert Moses knew. And um, there are people who made these decisions because they didn't care. And they felt that certain people were disposable and it was okay to harm them. And it's not okay to harm certain other people. Um, uh, and, and in fact, they should be benefiting off of the harm that it causes us. That is infuriating. It's gross. Not surprising, but infuriating. That book is amazing. And we are going to have a link. We're going to have, maybe not links, we're going to have a list of all the different books that we talked about today. Uh, so that you can buy them from your local bookstore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and a link to- oh, I And I got this one links. used at Brand. All right. Okay, I got this used brand, um, uh, at one of our local bookstores here in New York. Excellent. <laughs> but it's one of my favorite things to, you know, browse their books. But yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a really good one. It's by an amazing scientist named Harriet Watching. Awesome. My yeah. book list just got so much longer. I know. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> um, Yulin, uh, thank you so, so, so much thank for joining so us. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. This was such an amazing conversation. I'm glad that we had this one. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And, you know, hopefully we'll stay in touch. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, we would love please. to have you back um, in a little while uh, after you've you know, had some time, had some life happen, and we'll see, we'll catch up with you, a follow-up. Yes, and to have that conversation about the educational system. Can't wait to have that one. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's talk about that one. Uh, <laughs> public school, through, you know, even went to public school for undergrad and grad school, so. Yeah, awesome. Amazing. Um, again, I don't know what to say, except yeah, thank you. Thank and you so much. We look forward to having you back on the show at a later date. Yeah. Can't wait. All right, looking okay. forward to it. Yes, Bye. you too. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Um, she's so fucking cool. She's so cool. I really am going to go buy all those books. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So you can go to um, www.whosthatpod.com. We're going to have a list of those books um, and resources about the Working Families Party. Talking to her, it just 
reestablishes for me, and I hope for everyone listening, how important it is to be involved in the political process in your neighborhood. Yes. Because she, and, and it is, it's true, New York is huge. Mm-hmm. It's huge. It has a huge population. And New York City is especially huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she has, she has such a big impact. And all, for one, because she is amazing and actually is on the ground, like mm-hmm. working as a servant leader. But even as just a legislator, she has such a big impact on her constituents' daily life. And so do the members of your city council and your state representatives. And so you need to know who they are, you need to know what they stand for, and you need to vote for those people. All right, I think we get into this idea that the only elections that matter are the presidency right. and your, your federal representatives in Congress and in the Senate, but the reality is the most impactful changes to your daily life are gonna come from your local leaders and your state level leaders. And we, we collectively owe it to ourselves yes. to engage in that discourse and to be a pain in the ass when it requires you to be a pain in the ass yeah. because you deserve leaders like you, Lynn. We yes. deserve leaders like you, Lynn. And instead of, of, of romanticizing the idea of like, oh, I wish she was my representative or looking at AOC and going, oh, I wish I could vote for her, you know, go out be involved in these organizations like Our Revolution, like Justice Democrats, find Mm -hmm. working families parties, Mm -hmm. working family party, working families party. Mm -hmm. That was hard for me. It's been a long day. Um, Find these organizations that are working to find these potential leaders and, and, and get in there on the ground and help, help get them elected because we, we all benefit from that engagement. Yes, and the the democratic process of the United States of America actually doesn't work unless the people are involved, full stop. So if you don't call your representatives, that's what they're there for. They're Mm -hmm. there to represent you. So if you don't call your representatives and tell them what you want, then that is a breakdown in the democratic process at step one. It's like what Eugene said, It's not broken. The system is working exactly the way it was meant to, to keep you disenfranchised, to keep you disengaged, and to keep you so fatigued that you don't even have time to look up from your own problems. But the reality is everything gets better when you engage, when we engage. Or perhaps the only way anything gets better is when we engage, when we the people engage. Hey, so thanks. Thanks for listening, you guys. Thank you. You you people. Um, We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We are on Instagram. We are on TikTok. Um, So please follow us on there. We are on YouTube, which is a big one. Um, The the YouTube does provide a video feed of this with closed captioning for hearing impaired. um, Or maybe people who are just more engaged when they have a visual. Uh, Either way, we are as accessible as we can be. And if you have ideas about how we can be more accessible, tweet us, email us. Yes, email us at info at who's that And you can find that on our website and you can find a link to our website on our link tree along with all of the social medias. If you like what we're doing here and you want to help support us, then you can uh, buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash who's that pod. And you can help us keep what we're doing and, and maybe help us uh, pay our producer Kathleen Please. To do this work for us. Please help us keep Kathleen. <laughs> we need her. <laughs> I love you so much. Huh? Say you. it back. You're okay. I quit. <laughs> I love you too, you big it's too goober. Late. That no, feels I... forced. It feels forced. <sighs> I love you too. We want to leave you with... Um, what I would say is probably one of our favorite quotes by Maya Angelou. And if you don't have it memorized by now, it's because you haven't watched enough of our episodes. Stop skipping the end of our episodes. Um, Maya Angelou says, uh, I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. Thank you for joining us on this journey as we learn how to do better. We love you. We love you. Bye.